But even though I've been involved with the Starship program from the beginning, and actually, like, I lived out here, but I'm still amazed that it took off. I'm like, wow. It is by far the biggest flying object ever made. A Starship is more than twice the thrust of a Saturn V. It is by far the biggest flying object ever made. And with, with some upgrades down the road, it'll, it'll actually be, I think, probably over 20 million pounds of thrust. And Saturn V is seven and a half. So it'll end up being three times the thrust of Saturn V. And it's gonna fly a lot. It has to fly a lot. It's gonna end up flying several times a day from many different locations in the world. And I think there's a pretty good chance that it, it does Earth-to-Earth -earth transport as well. Because the fastest way to get from one place to another on Earth, from here to the other side of Earth, is an intercontinental ballistic, continental ballistic missile uh, but just make sure you delete the nuke and add the landing part. Basically, that's the fastest way to get somewhere. And then between flight one and two, we made a number of, of massive upgrades. So the, there was obviously a massive upgrade to the launch pad. So we've got like our many Niagara Falls here. The water pressure is so much that if it went straight up, it would actually destroy the rocket. That's how much water pressure it is. So it's like, wow. And it worked. One of the first things I went and looked at after the second launch was to check out the launch pad because obviously after the first launch we dug a pretty big hole. It looked like there was no damage at all. Like they, the, you could just launch again basically for the pad itself. So it's great work by the team to radically improve the launch pad overnight. Yeah, people always like want to use the Statue of Liberty for stuff. Statue of Liberty is not that big. I was like, yeah, I was like, been there. I actually climbed up the Statue of Liberty in the tiny staircase a long time ago. But it, anyway, this this is a big rocket and it will get bigger over time. So that's, I don't know if you guys watched uh, Kong vs. Godzilla. It's like one of the most insane movies I've ever seen, but it's like kind of entertaining in its sheer madness. And the crazy thing is that, that our launch tower is bigger than Mechazilla. And it's gonna do basically like the same thing, but with the arms, you know, like catch the rocket. And when I tell people like, yeah, we're gonna catch the largest flying object ever with giant mechanical arms. They're like, there's no way that's real. I mean, we could give it legs too. Just give it legs and have it tromp around. That'd be pretty cool. So, and then we're also gonna build a second tower. So we're gonna, this is, this is, we're gonna really be launching a lot and, up, and we're gonna be upgrading one tower while we launch from another tower. So two towers is important. And there, was, there, there are actually so many upgrades between flight one and two that uh, it would actually take it like hours to go through them all. Uh, but one of the biggest upgrades was uh, going from uh, hydraulic to electric uh, actuation of the engines. So that actually uh, saved a lot of mass and complexity. The electric TVC, I mean, it, it, it was just, a, this is one of the biggest upgrades. We also massively upgraded the heat shield. The engines themselves were massively upgraded. Literally everything on the rocket was like, there might've been thousands of upgrades between flight one and two. So really gigantic improvement between flight one and two and also obviously many improvements between flight two and three. And then we've got a whole, development plan to, like I said, ultimately get to a fully reusable rocket that does over 200 tons to orbit on a regular basis. Full reusability. Hot staging. I mean, hot staging was a change that was basically really within a space of like th three or four months, maybe less, going from previously just kind of like uh, separating the rocket without anything to actually lighting the upper stage engines while the first stage engines are still thrusting and not blowing up the ship, which is that was an amazing achievement, and it worked. So I was like, wow. Flight 2 actually almost made it to orbit. In fact, ironically, if, if it had, had a payload, it would have made it to orbit, because the reason that it actually didn't quite make it to orbit was we vented the liquid oxygen, and the liquid oxygen ultimately led to fire and an, ex and an explosion, because we, we wanted to vent the liquid oxygen, because we normally wouldn't have that liquid oxygen if we had a payload. So ironically, if it had, had a payload, it would have reached orbit. And so I think we've got a really good shot of reaching orbit with flight three, and then a rapid cadence to achieve full and rapid reusability. And I mean, the, kind of the mind blowing thing is like there is an actual path that we are on to make life multiplanetary. Can you friggin' believe that? We just gotta get it done before civilization ends. But I, like, I think we, I think it's gonna happen. So in terms of getting there, we want obviously wanna accelerate the production and testing get to a high cadence, you know, for, for any given technology development, there it is, you know, how many iterations do you have and what is the amount of time between each iteration? Every time we launch or do a test, we learn something more. So increasing that cadence of launching and testing, and it's always better to sacrifice hardware rather than sacrifice time. Like time is the, true, the one true currency.
It's sort of the fastest path to a rapidly reusable, reliable rocket. And we've got yeah, a block, sort of a version two ship that will be more reliable, better performance, endurance. We've got a, a version three ship design that will stretch the, the and be even taller. <laughs> Probably end up being, I don't know, 140 meters before it's all said and done, maybe 150 in the end. With flight one, the goal was not to blow the, the, the pad up and ideally get some distance, which we did. With flight two, it was to get past a staging. So we achieved the goal of getting past a staging and almost to orbit. And then flight, flight three, we've got, well, we want to get to orbit and we want to do an in-space engine burn from the header tank and prove the, that we can re reliably deorbit. We want to do a tipping point a header domain propellant transfer. This is important for the NASA Artemis program. And we want to also demonstrate the payload door for the sort of PES dispenser for delivering the Starlink, the V2 non-mini, actually probably V, I guess V3 technically, but really the really giant satellites to orbit. The mass orbit ultimately of Starship will be, you know, over time, I think millions of tons of payload to orbit. Compared to present day mass to orbit, it'll be more than a thousand times, you know, more, more than a thousand times greater than mass to orbit currently. That's what it will be eventually, or it needs to be. So we also want to demonstrate on-orbit refilling. This is uh, very important for the NASA Artemis program. So we're very proud to be part of the NASA Artemis program. I'm always in incredibly grateful to NASA for their support and for trusting us to do to take astronauts to orbit, to take cargo to the space station, and to be an integral part of getting astronauts back to the moon. One of the other questions I get a lot is, did we really go to the moon? Yes, we went to the moon. Uh, more than once, in fact. But the crazy thing is that it's been over half a century since we last went to the moon. Maybe that's what causes people to be skeptical, like how come we, we can't go to the moon now? It was 66 years from the first controlled powered flight of the Wright brothers in 1903 to landing on the moon in 69. 50 years have passed since we last went to the moon. But now we're gonna go back there and we're gonna go back there soon. The next step, I think, is to build a, a, a moon base, like Moon Base Alpha. Make sci-fi real. In order to go and land on the moon, one of the technical challenges we have to solve is uh, orbital refilling, where we dock, the starships dock on orbit and transfer propellant. Now, we've gotten very good at docking, because we've, we dock with the Dragon to the space station, which is actually more complicated than docking with our own spacecraft. We have a lot of expertise in docking, so I'm confident we will solve this, and we just ideally want to solve it, hopefully by the end of this year, uh, but certainly by, by next year. And that, that's a big deal. This is one of the fundamental technologies that's necessary to, to build a city on Mars and to have a, Mars, a moon base. And then, yeah, we'll also be launching some very big satellites, world's biggest PES dispenser. And we do hope to do this by the end of this year. As I said, we're extremely grateful to NASA for entrusting us with a fundamental part of the Artemis program. We want to make sure we do a great job for NASA. And, and really, the, we, like we are a very fundamental part of the, the Artemis program. So if we do not succeed, which we will, but we, we, in order for the Artemis program to succeed, we must succeed with, with Starship. And uh, like I said, we actually want to far exceed what NASA has asked us to do. So, so the, we want to go far beyond the NASA requirements and actually be able to put enough payload on the moon with enough frequency that you could actually have a permanently occupied moon base. That's the next really big threshold from Apollo, is have, a, have an actual moon base. This is the long-term goal. This is what we want Mars to look like, is uh, starships coming and going, an incredible, beautiful Mars city, and uh, a flourishing uh, civilization on Mars. And ultimately, we can transform Mars into an Earth-like planet with uh, terraforming. It just needs to be warmed up, really. And then you could, it, it could be ultimately an Earth-like planet, and we could bring the life from Earth, we could, we could extend life from Earth to Mars. And really, it's, it has to be, you know, it has to be humans, actually, because yeah, it's not going to be the dolphins. But we can bring all the creatures with us, and we can ensure that life on Earth continues on Mars, even after Earth becomes unlivable in the distant future.